church. So here after uh, the second service, or at the end of the second service, we'll take in the Lord's Supper. Hopefully everyone got the memo. If you've been bouncing around the building looking for your adult Bible fellowship, uh, this is where it's at, of course, obviously every fifth Sunday at nine o'clock. So we're glad to have you this morning, and I'm excited to be able to uh, just uh, have an opportunity to uh, just... I get to listen this morning. So normally, uh, one of the pastors prepares us for the Lord's Supper, but this morning we're going to have a special guest at uh, 1030, uh, Brian Calloway. So I moved Pastor Steve to the 9 o'clock hour, and we're going to prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. But before we do that, I want to just take a little bit of time and focus on mission. And as we do that, I just want to just kind of compliment what we've already praised and sung to the Lord. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, you know, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, I'm blameless. I mean, that guy was zealous. He says, but what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You know, this morning in both of those songs, as we sang, that's really what we were talking about, right? To just know Jesus more and to know him and the power of his resurrection being conformed right into his very image, because Christ, the image of God, is in us. It's exciting to be saved. It's exciting uh, to be a part of God's mission. And this church, it's exciting to be part of what's God, what God's doing. I know you guys are probably worn slick. It's been a long week. I know, I know I've been busy. I know you've been busy. So I pray today we can take a collective rest uh, and kind of rejoice in what God has done this week, but also what God's going to do. And uh, one of the things that God's been doing, you know, every week throughout the year, there's always ministry happening. There's ministry happening in the children's wing. There's ministry happening at the jail. There's ministry, I mean, week after week after week, there's ministry happening. Uh, and sometimes you don't hear that much about what's happening because it's just happening with faithful folks just doing their business, just got their hand on the plow, like Ruth, just taking care of what they can get in the corners of the fields before Jesus comes, right? And so that's what we should all be about doing. And one of the ministries I wanted to highlight this morning in the time we have is, is what God is doing uh, with the uh, ministry of um, gospel, how do I say it? Gospel, fe Children's fe Evangelism Fellowship, is that right? Well, Good News Clubs for short, yeah. Okay, Child Evangelism Fellowship. If I had my act together, I'd have had all that down. I thought it was up here, but as you found, it's not. So anyway, Ch Child Evangelism Fellowship uh, is a is a para there's a not for profit type of parachurch ministry, but um, it's an incredible thing uh, to see uh, what God is doing through the Good News Club. So Larry and Barb Boucher, they faithfully have been serving. As I said, gleaning in the corners of the field in a very important place. Just to, and I'm going to invite you to just a second. Just a few weeks ago, I was at the Bright Futures meeting. I hadn't been in several years. I was at the inaugural uh, Bright Futures meeting here several years ago. And, and it was really just a proclamation that the school needs us. Needs us being the business community, the church community. And they found a mechanism to kind of help fit that together. And we've, you've seen the blue uh, barrel and you've seen us collecting underwear this last week and all those or this last month and, and trying to collect and trying to help and just be a good neighbor, right, to our friends. But the reality is I went to this uh, Bright Futures meeting this, this uh, last few months ago and I uh, was sitting there listening and, and uh, man, my heart was just, was just broke uh, because the school system is in such a situation that, that the situation is not getting any better. Uh, kids are coming in. The families are eroding. Just let me cut to the chase for time's sake. The family is eroding in our community. At least I'm talking about Harrisonville proper right now. Uh, I'm sure it's happening in every community. But in Harrisonville right now, the family structure is eroding. And so the teachers and the staff, they're left there to try to pick up the pieces. So you, want, you th sit there as a pastor and you say, man, I appreciate these people. They're just trying to do what they can with what they got. They're supposed to be here educating the children. But they do realize without compassion, if they don't get those kids some clothes, uh, some underwear, right? Some clean things, some food. You know, when they're little, we give them the backpacks to take home. As they get older, they got to be a lot more under the under the radar, helping the kids so they're not embarrassed and all of those things. And and I'm sitting there watching the the, the wonderful people in the school system try to deal with social needs that are meant to be handled in the family, and then meant to be supplemented, of course, by the local New Testament church. And it all starts with Jesus. And so I'm so thankful when we have an opportunity to literally reach into the school system and bring what is really needed, and that is Christ. And, and I'm also thankful, at least for I can speak for Harrisonville, for a school system that says, hey, we understand all the laws and stuff, but you know what? We also recognize the church is an important part of this, so we're going to make a way to get them in there. Well, one of the ways that the Harrisonville school system allows 
the church to get into the schools through the Good News Club. And, and Barb, or Larry and Barb Boucher have been so faithful to serve there for how many years now? Four or five years? Maybe four years, five years? And so they've done a great job. I, wanna, I don't want to steal their thunder, but I want to just take off a little bit of time this morning, have them come up and share with you what they've been doing. And uh, also I can do that so we can pray, right? That's one of the things that we can all do. If we can't go in with them, we can pray and we can send the Spirit of God in with them. So if you guys come up, give them some love as they come and present the ministry of Good News Club. Are you sure? Yeah. Are we on? Sure. Talk closer about that. Are we there? Okay. Very good. My name is Larry Boucher. Um, hang on a sec. Way too much stuff in my hand. Okay, start over again. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Larry Boucher. This is my wife, Barbara, and Joyce Slayhuber. Uh, we're the, the uh, part of the team, about half of the team of the Good News Club. Uh, it's a child evangelism fellowship group uh, called the Good News Club uh, that meets weekly in the, <clears throat> excuse me, that meets weekly in the school at the Harrisonville Elementary School. Uh, we'll be seeing, and we'll get to get the slide presentation going here right now. Uh, we'll be seeing a peek of what goes on every week uh, at the school uh, as our in our Good News Club. So that that's that's coming shortly. So anyway, the Good News Club is just what the name says. It's good news about our Savior Jesus Christ and how we can all know Him as our personal Savior. We work with 25 to 30 kids every week. Uh, in the second, third, and fourth grade levels. Um, the program is based and organized by Child Evangelism Fellowship, and we use their materials. We go and do their training. Uh, we follow their, in their materials exclusively as it follows the Bible in every aspect of teaching uh, being done. The club meetings are all like an in-depth Bible study. It's not a babysitting time. It's not a place where we color and do crafts and all that fun stuff that we normally associate with kids' uh, activities. It's a very fast-paced, detailed, study-focused uh, time where we're learning, where the central focus of, our, of, our, of the whole program, the, the central focus of it is man's sin, nature, and knowing Jesus Christ as a savior to deal with that sin nature. And so with that said, I can say a lot more. We could talk all morning, but uh, Joyce, would you like to share with us just a little bit about uh, what's, what's going on in your life in com compared to uh, Good News Club? I would love to. Good morning. The teaching objective from Child Evangelism Fellowship Training, this is a quote, so I don't get it wrong. The objective is that the unsaved child will believe God desires to have fellowship with him or her and that God made a way for him or her to be restored to God's original design. And, that's the end of quote, of course we know that those that are saved also need to be fostered and cultivated by learning about Christ. So we do that. And another quote from Child Evangelism Fellowship is that we help to lay the foundation for salvation by helping children to acknowledge three main truths, that God is our foundation, our maker, and our creator. And we prepare children to believe that God's way of salvation through Jesus is the only way to be forgiven and to have eternal life. That's what makes it the, it's the most wonderful time of the day. With the kids singing praises and everyone telling you God and his word. It's the most wonderful time of the day. There'll be parties for fun for all our special ones. And we pray you will join us because... It's the most wonderful time of the day. Thank you. And it is fun. 
and they do learn. We have songs, Bible lesson, review games, scripture memory. We have parties that Bilinas provide from the Sonic ice cream, hot fudge, and sprinkles for all the parties. The kids enjoy that. But it is fun. It's uplifting. It's upbeat. And we could use a couple more people to join us. Thank you. And now I'll let my wife uh, uh, give her uh, spin on this whole thing. But I didn't know we was going to get a song. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that the Lord continues to teach me every day and every week, including this morning, because this morning I left, a home, left our house and I left my purse there. And I cannot see a thing without my glasses. <laughs> so I hope you're all out there. <laughs> no, I, I typed... I, printed this really um, big, so I, I can read it. But um, what the song says, the, the um, chorus of the song that we just sang, bid me come and die that I may truly live. Um, God doesn't forget us when we get old. He keeps on having us die to ourselves every day, every minute as often as we need to, so that we can live for him. And um, that's, that's the reason um, I'm in the Good News Club ministry. Um, I was, we, we've, I've been, um, I've served underneath, um, I would say underneath three trainers, or three um, team leaders uh, since I started that means about every year, one of them hits the dust. And, <laughs> and so uh, a couple years ago, they asked me to be the trainer, or the team leader, excuse me, keep thinking trainer. But um, I, I convinced my husband Larry to um, be a part of this. And more than that, the Lord convinced my husband Larry to be a part of this. And... Um, I believe we are a team where I'm not the leader. We're a team um, because he provides what I can't um, for, for our team. And then, of course, we have wonderful helpers like Joyce who volunteer every week. Um, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that... Um, we just finished the Bible conference where we put forth the word of God. And, and again, and uh, adding to what Larry said uh, and Joyce about Good News Club being the word of God, it truly is. Um, I've taught a number of Christian curricula for children over the years, and none has emphasized the word of God as much as the materials from Child Evangelism Fellowship. The Word of God is the focal point of everything we do from the beginning of club where we talk about and practice prayer to the songs we sing, which are scripture set to music, to the memory verse teaching, to the wonder time application, the missionary story, which uh, Joyce traditionally does, both of those, to the Bible lesson, and even the uh, activity of the review games we play. The goal is for the child to be actively, not passively, immersed in the Word of God and God's plan of salvation for their lives. I'd like to encourage you to get involved uh, in this mission. And uh, for those of you who are my age, retirement is not a word in the Bible. <laughs> As we begin our school year um, of weekly Good News Club meetings this, this week, we're going to begin on Monday, on Thursday, which is an appropriate day because it's our Take Your Bible to School Day. We would ask that you pray for the teachers who teach and the children who will attend. Um, Larry's going to lead us in prayer and, um, and give a certificate of appreciation to Brian and our church. But before I do that, I, got, I, I thought of something else I wanted to say. You know, we... We labored here, I say we, and I didn't do as much as I probably should have, but we labored the last week 
of creating 9,000 books or pieces of paper and, and they're God's word. We put them in boxes and we shipped them. Okay, we can do the same thing. Now we need to apply those words and we can apply those words right here locally and we don't even have to put them in a box and ship them. Just come over to elementary school and be with us. And we're, we're you know, we're opening that word up and we're, we're, we're breaking it apart and we're giving it to the kids and we're letting them absorb it. We're giving them an opportunity to, to, to became, become saved. And, you know, to literally jerk them out of the fires of hell. And that's, that's pretty awesome when we get to thinking about it, you know. So uh, it's a wonderful thing. And just like Pastor was saying about the needs in the school, the needs is great there. But all those needs will work themselves away if we're living for Christ. And if, if Johnny's living for Christ and Susie's living for Christ and they bring mom and they bring dad, if there is a dad, if there's not a dad, they bring that person along too. And, you know, that's, that's the, the whole key of the whole thing is, is bringing the kids and the parents uh, to the Lord. So um, with all of that said, um, let, let's pray. Other churches involved. Okay, that, that's something I did forget. We've got, I, I said something earlier about this was a team of three, but actually it's a team of six. Uh, we've got two other people from First Baptist Church here in town, and they're basically the founders and the supporters of the Good News Club. Um, and then we've got one other lady that goes to Crossroads, I think, right now. Eagle and Creek. Eagle Creek, maybe. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, we're, we're not, you know, it's not us four and no more. We're open to the community because the school is a community school, and we want we want to reach everybody. And so, um, with that said, uh, let's pray. Precious Lord, we come to you. We thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to be your little um, miniature missionaries right here in our own backyard. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless the ministry. We just ask the people that, that, that you would put in their hearts to, to pray for us and pray for the kids. And, and this week, even as we uh, anticipate being into school at, at uh, 3.30, a quarter to four, and, and start seeing the kids come into the room and see the excitement on their faces, Lord, we just ask that, that if any of those kids that's coming this week um, don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, they'll see uh, through the prayer time, through the, the lesson, through the games, through the, all the things that we do there, that they'll see that they, they're lost and that they need to ask you to come into their heart and, and be their Savior. And, and they'll have that opportunity at the end of the, end of the, the training session or the um, lesson that, that we'll talk with them individually, one-on-one, -on -one, if there's an indi indication that they, they want to ask questions or know more about uh, knowing Jesus as their personal Savior. And, and Lord, we just ask that you would help us to be diligent to, after these kids make that decision, that we will be diligent to follow up with them, with, that we do everything we can to disciple them and get them into a, a Bible-believing church and a place that they can come, that they can be baptized, that they can start uh, walking uh, with you on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and all this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, and, and we've got some, um, uh, to be a part of Good News Club, you need to go through a training program, and you have to be checked out by the FBI and all that stuff. <laughs> and, uh, but there is a, tra a mandatory training uh, program. Uh, there'll be some of those out on the, on the information counter if you're interested in that. I think the next one is, uh, I don't know, anyway. Um, so at this time, the, the, the Good News Club, uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship kind of puts a little a little spin on this. You may remember this from last year. Rather than giving a certificate of appreciation, we it's a, a, a certificate of adoption. So the Good News or the uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship organization, the Kansas City chapter, of the Good News Club has adopted Heartland Baptist Fellowship as their partners in Christ to, and I I, I won't get this right. Get the word out on time at the right time and where time and all that stuff. But anyway, to get it from here to the 
Harrisonville Elementary School on time. And I think, I think we're doing that, you know. So, so we appreciate that. With that said, Brian, would you come up and, and receive this, uh, this certificate of adoption from uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship? Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, guys. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, that's awesome. Isn't that cool? That's for you. We've been adopted by in more ways than one. Romans 9 tells us about that too. So praise the Lord. May God adopt a lot of people into the kingdom of God through this ministry. And, and uh, we're thankful for Child Evangelism Fellowship and of course how God has positioned people in our church to be very influential right here in our local school. So right now before I transition here, I want to just, is there anybody that would say, you know, I'm praying about this. I think maybe God would have me be a part of that. You're bold enough to, to like say right now. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Grandson Jackson was saved. Amen. Yeah, her grand. Amen. Praise God. What a testimony. Amen. Hey, fruit that remains. That's awesome. And there have been several. We didn't really mention several salvations. Five last year. Kids making professions for Christ. And I know some of you are like, well, that should be their parents' job. Yeah, it should be. But guess what? Their parents are probably doing who knows what, some of them. Or maybe some of them are good parents and their kids just got the gospel. They'll work with parents that obviously want to get their kids where they need to go. But there's a lot of kids there that just, you know, this is their only shot. If you missed Mike Blake's message last Wednesday, you got to go back and listen to that. That dovetails nicely with what we're hearing about. Any word's a good word. And man, I thank God is putting the ball in their hands to get the word of God where it needs to go. If you want to join that team, you should. Okay, uh, pray about it because they do need help. That's not, there's no accident that God had them get up this morning. Maybe God's putting that on your heart. So uh, count the cost. There's some background checking and all of those things that need to be done, some training and so on and so forth. So you don't just show up on a Thursday night. And that's good because they're protecting the integrity of the ministry and the children. So praise God for that. But man, they could use some help. And so... Uh, you're like, well, I don't think it's me. Well, good. Well, pray for those that God does want to send. There's laborers that need to be sent to that field, just like the sound booth and the children's ministry and the Good News Club and the jail, so on and so forth. So praise God. All right, well, let's go ahead and just, uh, as we're transitioning here, I want to invite Steve. I don't want to take any more of his time. Steve is coming to charge us in the Word this morning, and, and, and our hearts are stirred. Now let's prepare him to take the Lord's Supper. Man, give Steve some love. We love you, Steve. I want to intersect you. Thank you. All right. Good morning. My name is Pastor Steve Fleshman. With uh, uh, my wife and I came here about 15 years ago, uh, Angie, and uh, most of you know our son Luke, and uh, Sarah's with us today. Uh, her husband comes home on Thursday from uh, from Germany, so her and the girls are looking forward to that. <clears throat> I am the uh, pastor of the Journey class, and uh, several of our folks are here today. I also uh, lead the uh, Life Issues Addiction Recovery Program here at uh, HBF, and we came in 2005, and uh, I think it was 2011 we started the uh, Life Issues uh, Addiction Recovery Ministry a little over eight years ago, and one thing I look for in our class, uh, our Journey class, as well as, as our uh, Life issues, folks, is just their heart. Is uh, is their heart to turn toward God? Is their heart to serve the Lord and follow Him? And uh, so, one, uh, I'm going to have our life issues, folks, stand right now. We we've uh, memorized our theme verse. It's uh, Proverbs 4:23. We're gonna, we're just going to quote that for you. If you're part of our group and uh, you would like to quote that with us, uh, Proverbs 4:23. It says. To keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And so thank you. Give them some love for me. <clears throat> so praise the Lord. Today my topic is uh, redemption as we prepare our hearts for taking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, I'm excited to hear Brian Calloway, our, our missionary uh, in Zambia. And uh, he... Uh, a few years ago could have been part of our group and he'll hopefully share some of that with you today and so we love uh, Brian <clears throat> but as this topic of redemption uh, I grew up on a farm in North Missouri until I was 25 years old we, we moved down here with with Luke when he was a year old and uh, but while we were on the farm some of you may 
may remember S and H green stamps. Does anybody remember? Okay, wow. I, I had to Google that. We discontinued those in the 80s, it said, uh, but they started around the early 1900s, late 1800s, and uh, so how it worked in, in at our. Uh, for me in particular, my dad, uh, at, our, at the height of our farming, we had 800 uh, yearlings. We had uh, hogs, we had cattle, we had uh, uh, cows, we had row crop. It's uh, a rolling, rolling land up there, and so we were pretty diversified. But, uh, so we fed a lot of protein with our corn, so we bought a lot of feed. And so the merchant at the store would give us stamps for all the feed we bought. And, and we got a lot of stamps. And, and uh, so then we would get their little, uh, their little books, and I would glue the stamps in the books, and then I would look at their rewards catalog, and, and uh, that's how I was able to get a tent, a hatchet. I used to camp and stuff. And uh, so what I would do is I would take the stamps, and I would redeem them for merchandise. And so that, that's, that's kind of when I think of redemption, I think of just growing up and collecting all these stamps. My brothers didn't really mess with it. I have two brothers. But uh, so I got all the stamps and uh, I had, you know, it might take 30 books of stamps to buy my tent and 10 books of stamps to get a hatchet. And so the, these are things that I remember uh, growing up. And so uh, as we talk about redemption, though, I want us to look at uh, the Romans... <clears throat> The Romans 8. Did I have that first? I may have messed you up, Randy. So uh, in Romans 8.22, uh, <clears throat> it says here, <clears throat> For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And... Uh, I'm going to kind of work backwards with redemption from like the Lord's coming and uh, work backwards to his first coming and even a picture in the Old Testament of, of redemption. But uh, when we think of creation, we all experienced that last night with the flash flooding. When, when I think of creation groaning in travail, I see the hurricanes on the news. I see the flooding locally. We, we see... Uh, uh, what is it, uh, global warming, that there's a big thing uh, even uh, internationally with, uh, and, and so all of us I think sense that, uh, and when you think of travailing, uh, the Bible uses that as a woman in travail when they have, give birth, and the, the thing I know about uh, childbirth is that uh, a woman gets pregnant, she is with child for approximately nine months, and then uh, when she experiences some contractions, she knows that this time is near to give birth, right? And the thing about contractions is they, they get closer together and they get more intense, don't they? And, and I think we do see that in, nat in, in nature. It says that the whole creation is groaning in travail. And uh, key on that word groaning <clears throat> Uh, but so, so it is with nature, and I've actually seen studies done that uh, like over a hundred years of tornadoes, they, they know that there's uh, more recently and some of them are more uh, devastating. And so uh, cr creation is groaning uh, for, to, to be redeemed, for, uh, to become a paradise again when the Lord's return in, in the millennium. And the next verse says there, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. And so those of us that are saved, we've been redeemed uh, by the blood of the Lamb. He has come into our life and our soul is redeemed. But don't we look forward to the redemption of our body? Don't we want to be adopted? And uh, Stan and I, he's a little older than me maybe, but we have aches and pains, don't we, brother? And all of us that are saved, we want that new body. We want to be uh, where we don't have the aches and pains and we don't uh, sorrow and we don't uh, have to sleep anymore. We can have uh, new bodies as uh, Philippians, I think it's 321 says, we have, we'll get glorified bodies. And so uh, one day the earth is going to be redeemed. One day our bodies are going to be redeemed. And so we groan until then. 
And Paul even says in 2 Corinthians 5, For we, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And so... Uh, <clears throat> Just like a woman uh, in travail, there's a process that leads up to a birth. And if you ask someone when they were born, uh, hardly ever will they say, it was in the spring, it was late fall. They won't say that. They'll say it was July, uh, July uh, in my case, uh, January 30th, 1961. And so we have a, there was a process that my mother went through, but there was a, an event that happened when I was born. And with our son, I know uh, he was born in, in Centerville, Iowa. And uh, it was an event. There was a process that led up to an event. And so it is with the Lord's coming. There's a process that leads up to an event. <clears throat> and do, do you know, uh, the, the next to the last verse of our Bible, Jesus says, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So... It doesn't seem like the Lord is coming quickly to us because, gosh, it's been 2,000 years. He promised he would come back, and he hasn't came back. But, beloved, we're groaning. It's getting close. The, 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 uh, the, the labor pains are becoming more intense. They're becoming closer together, and there will be an event, a day, a time that the Lord shall return. Amen? And at that time, we are going to be uh, married to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we will sit down and listen to this. At the marriage, what? Supper. We're going to have a marriage supper and, uh, of the Lamb. And that, uh, and that will be uh, after His second coming. So that, that is uh, when we will possess the redemption. We will, it will be uh, redemption possessed. But now let's talk about his first coming. When Christ came in Galatians 4, it says, And when the fullness of time was come, <clears throat> God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, it's to do what? To redeem them that uh, were under the law. He came, uh, that's one of my assignments in uh, HBI to uh, write out why did Jesus come to the earth? Well, here is one of the reasons he came. He came to redeem them that were under the law. He had his people and he was wanting to deliver them and uh, <clears throat> uh, that were under the law. And, and it came in the fullness of time. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are, but from Adam to Jesus was about 4,000 years. And so there was a process that led up to an event. And there was, a, a uh, you know, the kingdoms of the earth and everything was in line. And Rome was in power when Jesus came at his first coming. And in the fullness of that time, he was, uh, God's son uh, came forth and he was made of a woman to redeem them that are under the law. <clears throat> that we might receive the adoption of sons, it says. And uh, in John 1, so Jesus was born in the fullness of time. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And when he was about 30 years of age, Luke says, uh, uh, John 1, says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus was the Lamb of God, and that was just very significant to the Jews in particular who had uh, sacrificed a lamb every morning and every night for uh, hundreds of years. The law, the law was about 1,500 years uh, in existence from Moses till Jesus. And uh, when John sees Jesus, he says, that is the Lamb of God. This is the sacrificial lamb. And he was about 30 years of age at that time, the Bible says. And in the book of John, it records about four different Passovers. And so when he was 30, when he was baptized, and the next year there was a, ba uh, there was a Passover, and the next, and the next, and the next. And on the fourth Passover, uh, Jesus, he had uh, did his earthly ministry. He had performed all these miracles. He had spoken all these parables. He had discipled these 12 men. And they were sitting with him at the Lord's Supper when he was about 33 uh, and a half years old. 
<clears throat> and it says here in Luke, uh, Luke 22 is a passage that records the Lord's Supper for us. And uh, that, that's where I'm at in my Bible. There's like six or seven verses I want to read with you here in Luke 22 as we prepare for <clears throat> the Lord's Supper. Uh, Luke 22 and 14. <clears throat> It says, And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So he was eating the Passover uh, <clears throat> uh, according to the Jews' law. And uh, this was uh, just... Uh, four days before he rose from the dead. And, and he's having this, sometimes we call it the Last Supper. The Bible calls it the Lord's Supper. And in verse 16 he says, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And uh, uh, I, what, what I believe is this, this supper, he, he's going to eat it with them again at the marriage supper of the Lamb that we, that we spoke of earlier at his second coming. So again, you can see we're working backwards. In verse 17, and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine, that's uh, unfermented uh, wine, <clears throat> until the kingdom of God shall come. And, and that's at his second coming. Uh, verse 19, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So, so he knows what's about to be taken place and he's implementing that I, I want you to continue to do this in remembrance of me and this time we had together. And verse 20, it says, likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And so they, these, these two emblems that were so significant in the Passover were uh, what Jesus was signifying here at, uh, <clears throat> uh, right before he is crucified. And, and so even with Jesus' life, uh, he was born in the fullness of time. There's, uh, he was mentioned when he was 12 years old. He was mentioned at 30 years old. And then he, he, he makes his public ministry and, uh, with, with the Spirit of God. And, and, and again, you can see even with his life, there's a process that led up to the event. He was crucified uh, for no fault of his own. And he died on the cross, and he was buried, and three days later he rose again. And, and so these are uh, very significant in, in our lives and what it means to us. And before he did that, he implemented this uh, memorial, this ordinance. Uh, 1 Corinthians calls it an ordinance. And, and an ordinance is a rule that's established by authority. And uh, so some ordinances are uh, made law, <clears throat> and these, this is a memorial that uh, Christ asked us to observe uh, and, and, and as a command. <clears throat> and so the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, it represents Christ's broken body and His spilled blood. Christ instituted the Lord's Supper uh, at His Last Supper with His disciples uh, at the Passover. Uh, so at this time, we're going to review the Passover. We're going to look about how redemption is pictured by Israel being delivered from Egypt. So we talked about at His coming. We're going to be, uh, redemption is going to be possessed. We're going to get uh, new bodies. We're going to, the earth is going to be uh, made uh, like into the Garden of Eden again. Uh, it's groaning in travail. We're groaning in travail. But it was purchased on the cross of Calvary. And now we're going to see how redemption is pictured uh, through the Exodus. And, and I'm going to look at uh, Exodus. It was so cool that Brian asked me to speak today because uh, just a month ago, uh, less than a month ago, I was reading uh, through Exodus. I'm, I'm still in Exodus. And, 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 and as I read Exodus 12, I thought, boy, this would be a good message. And so I was, I was thinking, if, if I'm ever called upon to give uh, a message about the Lord's Supper, Exodus 12 would be good, but, but we're going to start in Exodus 2 here, and I want you to see a couple things of how redemption is pictured in the Old Testament. So Exodus 2 and verse 23 
through 25. <clears throat> and this is almost the same words as, as uh, it used in Galatians 4, 4. It says, and it came to pass in the process of time. That's what we're talking about, a process of time that leads up to this event. And uh, with the Lord, it was the fullness of time that he came. And, it's, and it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And look at verse 24. And God heard their what? Their groaning. Just like creation is groaning. Just like you and I are groaning. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. And so what the Bible says is that God saw their affliction because there, there arose up a Pharaoh who knew not God, who knew not Joseph or the God of Joseph. <clears throat> and he began to uh, see, gosh, Israel, the children of Israel, they're increasing. We've We've got to keep them from increasing or they're going to uh, overpower us and take over. And so they put them in bondage. And, they, uh, and when, when you're in bondage, and, and uh, I tell our Life Issues folks this, that uh, it's, it's very healthy to, to cry out, to cry out to the Lord for deliverance. And that's what these children of Israel are doing. They're in bondage. They've been in Egypt for about 400 years. And they're crying out to the Lord for deliverance. And you know what, when... I've studied this. Uh, I've got a list of about 20 verses in the Bible. Every time someone or a nation cries out, when they cry out to God, uh, I, I saw this week um, uh, two, two different people on the news crying out. One, one was down in Texas. Uh, a lady had lost their home to the flooding, and she was just wailing like, I've lost everything, and I, you know, I don't know what to do, and it's a desperate cry. And, and the other video I saw was of, uh, it, this is, sounds funny, it was a Japanese man at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, and he was weeping. He was crying. There's a guy video, and, he, and I don't know what he's crying, if he's praying, but he is crying out to God at the Wailing Wall uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, I don't know if you've ever really done that, but, you know, there, there's a crying, a boo-hoo, but there, there's another cry like the lady who just purse got stolen. Stop! Help! We, I need my purse back. I've lost everything. Somebody help me. And there, there's a desperation cry, and that, that's how these Israelites are. They're like, we're in bondage, God. Send us a deliverer. Please help. And when you cry like that, God will see your affliction. He will hear your cries, and he will deliver you. And that's what he did. He sent Moses. He called a man named Moses who uh, was kind of uh, on the run, so to speak. He had become a shepherd in another land, and God called him to come back to, uh, to Egypt and deliver God's people. And so I've got a, a dozen ways that Moses is a type of Christ, and I want us to look at those now. I think they're on the screen. But the Bible says that Moses was a goodly child at his birth, and uh, his parents put him in this uh, uh, ark and put him in the Nile River, and, and uh, Simeon, or Simon, he saw baby Jesus as the Messiah when uh, he was brought to uh, be circumcised on the eighth day in the temple. The second way is there was a peril of Moses' infancy. If you remember, they actually tried to kill all the male children two years and under. And that's the exact same thing that happened at Jesus' birth. There was a peril at Christ's infancy. Moses had become a shepherd. Uh, Jesus is called the Good Shepherd. Moses married a Zipporah. She was a Gentile bride. We know that Jesus is his spouse to the church, a Gentile bride for the most part. Moses is called very meek. Jesus uh, said he is meek and lowly. Moses was called a deliverer. He was also called a prophet, a lawgiver, and a judge. And Jesus is called those uh, same four things as well as a shepherd. So there's at least five names that they're called the same. Moses fasted for 40 days on Mount Sinai when uh, God gave him the Ten Commandments. And Moses fasted for 40 days uh, 
I'm sorry, Jesus fasted for 40 days after he was baptized. Moses uh, said, it, the Bible says he interceded for Israel. Uh, Jesus intercedes for us. And, you know, we don't use that word maybe a lot, but we, we, we have an interstate, don't we? We have an interstate that goes between uh, Kansas and Missouri. Uh, I-70 is an interstate. And so it, an inter, uh, it's a go-between. It's a mediator. And that's what Moses and Christ uh, are and were. And Moses made the people rest from their burdens. Uh, Jesus will give us rest when we take his yoke upon us. Moses gave manna, the bread from heaven, to Israel uh, during their 40-year wandering. And Jesus is also called the bread of life. And Moses finished the work of God. And Jesus finished the work of God. Uh, that was his last uh, comment on the cross. It is finished. And uh, Moses established a memorial, the Passover, and Jesus established a memorial, the Lord's Supper. So these are ways that uh, Jesus, or I'm sorry, Moses pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so the way that Moses went back to deliver his people, it was a process that led up to an event. Um, <clears throat> Exodus uh, 11, uh, 7 says, but against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord hath put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So God began uh, separating his people unto himself, and he used these plagues. <clears throat> and uh, the very last plague, we'll, we'll look at the plagues in just uh, a minute here. But in Exodus 12, if, if you're in Exodus, go ahead and turn to Exodus 12 and verse 12. Because uh, I believe that uh, God was using these ten plagues that uh, Moses and Aaron brought upon Egypt to uh, counteract their gods. So there, there, there were false gods in Egypt. In Exodus 12:12. 12, 12, it says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And uh, I also have him put a couple other verses on the screen. Uh, when, when Moses is telling his father-in-law Jethro about what happened in, in Egypt a few chapters later, uh, Jethro says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein they dwell proudly, He is above them. And so God was proving Himself to the Egyptians and to His people that He is above the gods of Egypt. And there's one more verse that speaks to this in Numbers. It says, For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them, upon their gods also the Lord executed judgments. And uh, so I haven't put up the uh, list of the plagues there. And uh, there's evidence uh, from history and archaeology that the, there's a list there of the Egyptians' gods that match up with the plagues. And uh, the thing, part, part of the reason I had him put this up there is <clears throat> uh, the interesting thing is these first three plagues happened to Egyptians and Israel. They happened to both God's people and, and I, I kind of pondered that and I don't know exactly why God allowed his people to experience these first three plagues. But I would suspect that maybe they bought into, they were worshiping some false gods is my guess. And uh, God needed to impress upon them, hey, this is not the true God. I am the true God. And uh, look at these first three. <clears throat> it was the, the water to blood. Uh, they, they had a sacred river god because the Nile was the, uh, the source of life there in Egypt and it still is. The frogs, there was a goddess of reproduction and uh, that has to do with uh, sexual sins and uh, promiscuity and God judged that. And the lice... Uh, he, there was a God of the earth. There was a, a worshiping of kind of a, a, na a nature God. And all those things the Israelites ex uh, experienced as well as the uh, Egyptians. And so if, if you kind of just go down through there, 
uh, the flies, they, they had a god to insects and a sacred beetle, the moraine, they had a, a god to bulls and cows, there was a boils, they had, look at the name of the Egyptian god there, typhoon, we have typhoid fever, I think maybe comes from that, they had a god of medicine and peace, uh, God sent hail, it, they had a god of atmosphere and disorder, God sent locusts because they had a god of grain and crops. And God sent darkness because they had a sun god named Ra. And I think that's actually in the uh, Ten Commandments movie, uh, Ra. But uh, uh, Baal is also known as a sun god that the uh, Babylonians had. And then this death of the firstborn, the god of creation and life. Uh, what, I, what I think there is, uh, for the you and I can take away, is God is pointing that there's something wrong with our first birth. There was a death of the firstborn, and I think God is pointing that there's something wrong with our firstborn, and you need the blood of the lamb on the post of your door uh, in order to be saved. <clears throat> and so that, that is the picture of redemption in the Old Testament. All these plagues were a process that led up to an event, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I think this is probably a good time to say this. Th this blood on the door, it allowed the destroyer to pass over their house. And, uh, you know, it says, when I see the blood, I will pass over. And uh, I, was, I listened to a little YouTube video about the Passover this week, and it showed that they took of uh, bitter herbs because they'd been in bitter bondage. They were, they, there was some lettuce and some greenery on the, the Passover meal where because it represented new life. It was springtime. They were coming out of bondage. Uh, certainly there was the wine. There's actually four cups of wine, it said, and, and uh, it represented the blood of the lamb that was on the doorpost. And uh, the, the way they did that, when they put it on the, it said the lintel and the side post, uh, this guy that was telling the Passover story was a Christian on this video I watched. And he said that uh, that, that uh, it makes uh, <clears throat> almost the exact word in Hebrew for life, and, and I thought that was interesting. That uh, this, if you, if you paint a doorpost kind of an upside down U, and uh, I looked up the word life, it's got a little asterisk by it. But uh, but anyway, uh, if you had the door the blood on your doorpost, you were saved and you were spared uh, death and you were given life. And I just thought that was uh, so instructive. And so uh, <clears throat> now as we just talk about redemption is possible for you and me, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish. And that uh, sometimes God has to use sorrow of heart to break our spirit. The Bible says that His eyes are upon the righteous and His ears are open to their prayers. He sees the affliction, He hears the groaning, the sighs, and He will send a deliverer. And so look at uh, Exodus 12. There's just a couple of things I wanted to point out here that uh, how God made this Exodus possible for them. And, and by the way, uh, the book of Exodus, uh, I, I'm looking at four exit signs right now. The, the word exit comes from Exodus. They, they're leaving Egypt. And you can leave Egypt. You can leave the gods of this world and you can be saved and you can be redeemed and uh, you can partake of the fruit of the vine and the broken, uh, the unleavened bread and uh, have that in remembrance. But in Exodus 12 and verse 3 through 5, <clears throat> this is, uh, it says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a, an house. So there is one lamb. <clears throat> and if the house be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating uh, shall make your count for the lamb. So there was a lamb, the lamb. And then in verse 5, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish a male... It's a male lamb of the first year. Ye shall take it out of from the sheep or from the goats. And so uh, it was 
your, uh, it was uh, a lamb, and it had to become it had to be the lamb, and then it became your lamb. It was a personal lamb, and uh, it was the innocent for the guilty, the just for the unjust, the clean for the unclean. <clears throat> that was the lamb. And in verse 17 of this same chapter, it speaks of the unleavened bread. In verse 17, it says, And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generation, generations by an ordinance forever. So uh, the unleavened bread... Uh, you, you might uh, guess, but uh, unleavened just doesn't contain yeast, right? Uh, leaven is like yeast. So it had to be unleavened because uh, they were getting out quickly. Their, their exodus happened in one night. Two million people left Egypt in one night. And so you don't have time for the bread to rise. Don't put any yeast in it. Uh, drink the fruit of the vine without uh, any leaven. Take the, the, the bread. It's unleavened because you got to get out. You got to uh, eat on the go here. And uh, it, it was an ordinance. <clears throat> now, at the very end of this chapter, there were some, uh, there was some uh, warnings about this, this memorial. In verse 43, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. And he says, there shall no stranger eat thereof. So uh, it, it, it's for God's people only. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. So in other words, you could be a proselyte. You could become circumcised and uh, be part of uh, God's people Israel. And it says in verse 45, A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. So it, it's for all of God's people. Verse 48. <clears throat> and when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and keep the Passover to the Lord... Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. So uh, the Jews had the sign of circumcision. Uh, we have a, uh, I think baptism is called a seal. And uh, so uh, it's likened to uh, baptism there. So people, after they're circumcised, they could take of the Passover. And it says, let him come near and keep it, and he sh shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Thus did all the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass the selfsame day, so in one day, this was an event, that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. And so, hallelujah, this whole process, the plagues, the bondage, it all led up to this climax of leaving Egypt. And uh, I hope that you have a day and an hour where you've trusted Christ. And <clears throat> if, if you're still uh, there in, in Exodus, it says in verse 21 and 22... This is instructed, 21 and 22. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And then look at this, verse 22. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out the door of, the, of his house until the morning. And so um, we are not really familiar with hyssop, but s some people say that uh, they used hyssop as kind of a brush. It's a plant, and they would, uh, I, don't, I don't know how they make paint brushes nowadays. I don't know if they use hyssop, but it was like a brush. So they took this plant, this little bushy plant, and they would paint the door. And uh, here's the word. That's how they applied the blood. And some people say that this hyssop is like faith. 
that faith is how we apply the blood. We, we all believe Christ died for us. He was God in the flesh. He lived a perfect sinless life. He died and was buried and he rose again. And when we believe that by faith, it's applied to our lives, right? And we can have that life, just like the Hebrews had life over their doorpost. And do you, do you know what uh, David says in Psalm 51, verse 7? He says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He needed this faith to be purged. And you know when Jesus was on the cross? When Jesus was on the cross in John 19, 29, and 30, it says, Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And so let, let's uh, pray as we uh, think about these things. Lord, we do come to you in prayer. We close this time in prayer. And uh, Father, I thank you for uh, just uh, reminding me of this groaning and this inner sighing that we have to be clothed upon with new bodies. This sighing that we have to uh, for the earth to be... Uh, at peace again, and the lion shall lay down with the lamb. And uh, and yet, Lord, we, we groan for others that are 